Hello, uh, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Marwa Farag. I am an associate professor at the Doha Institute for Graduate Study. My area is public policy. And uh, I have the honor of being the moderator for, the, for this session. And uh, this afternoon session will be discussing terrorism and insurgency studies. And uh, we will have four presentations each presentation lasting about 20 minutes, and then sh we should have about 40 minutes for questions and discussion. So uh, now I want to, to start right away, so let me start by introducing our first panelist. Uh, our first panelist is Professor Kumar Ram, uh, Ramakrishna. He is a professor of National Security Studies, the Provost Chair in National Security Studies, and the Dean of the Raja Ratnam School of International Studies at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. His book titled Radical Pathways, Understanding Muslim Radicalization in Indonesia was featured as one of the top 150 books on terrorism and counterterrorism in the journal Perspectives on Terrorism, which identified him as one of Southeast Asia's leading counterterrorism experts. His latest book is Extremist Islam, Recognition and Response in Southeast Asia, was published by Oxford University Press in 2022. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Ramakrishna to you now, our first panelist. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Farag and uh, colleagues. Uh, thank you. Uh, Kumar Ramakrishna here. Uh, very sorry that I couldn't uh, join you in person. I had actually intended to, but uh, unfortunately, we had a uh, family situation back here, back home here in Singapore, so I couldn't join you. But I'm very glad that I can at least uh, join you uh, by Zoom. So, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. my good friend, Dr. Omar Ashur, and colleagues uh, at the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. Uh, in Doha Institute for organizing this extremely important and timely conference on the state of uh, security and strategic studies. I've uh, been following uh, the discussions over the past couple of days, and I think this is a very timely uh, event for sure. So the uh, Dr. Ashur has asked me to uh, present some thoughts on the issue of uh, uh, the case against uh, uh, critical terrorism studies, right? Uh, revisited. So let me just share some slides. So I hope you can see that. So, yeah. So, uh, well, I mean, that's the my brief for this uh, afternoon, your afternoon, my evening here. The case against critical terrorism studies revisited. So, uh, just have a few points uh, to sort of go through. Uh, and the time all uh, allocated to me so just uh, uh this is some uh, this is this ground has been covered a little uh, especially past uh, past uh, few sessions so i'll just briefly touch on them again the critical approach to security studies what do we mean by that critical terrorism studies as a subset of the general critical approach to security studies so a uh, discussion point would be uh you know would uh, cts or critical terrorism studies uh, is it really an alternative uh, paradigm to mainstream, let's call it ma mainstream terrorism studies. Some people call it orthodox terrorism studies, or I mean, you can call it mainstream for this uh, uh, purpose of this session. So is, is it is CTS, to what extent is CTS really an alternative to mainstream terrorism studies? Uh, one of the things which I, I, I personally feel is something worth uh, discussing uh, is the challenge is uh, what I call the blurred boundaries problem in activism and scholarship, I'll go into that. And just uh, to say uh, right here that, uh, you know, uh, this I, I take this as an intellectual exercise to foster academic debate. Uh, I know that colleagues who, who uh, work in CTS, so I have a lot of respect for them. So I just uh, want to just put that out there. I uh, hope nobody takes some brunch of what I say and just want to have an academic debate. This is a work in progress, certainly, and I hope to be able to contribute to the planned book, uh, which uh, Dr. Ashur and colleagues are planning. So what's this critical approach to security studies in brief? So again, just a quick recap. Uh, following Marx, critical theorists argue that a primary goal of 
uh, philosophy is to understand and to help overcome the social structures to which people are dominated and oppressed. So if you look at the critical security literature, uh, it's about uh, exposing so-called hierarchies of oppression, right? Uh, of looking beyond the state, looking at uh, different preferred objects of security beyond the state. Human security for, uh, is very, very key. So at the core of critical security studies, as has been discussed in previous sessions, are the concepts of human security and emancipation developed by, among other schools, because nowadays there are a lot of uh, perspectives, uh, well-known schools, Copenhagen, Paris, and Frankfurt School scholars. And recently, we have uh, heard about the, the rise of a very interesting Beirut school promoting a decolonial approach to critical security studies, which I think personally is an uh, interesting new development. So essentially, as we, as many of us know, uh, critical security studies draws attention to how security threats are socially constructed, right? It, I mean, it's something which we create. It's not an objective reality, so to speak. Uh, I think an important point which CSS uh, uh, highlights is the role of identity politics, uh, and, and pretty important as well, I would agree, the various dimensions of human security. I mean, the UN uh, Development Report on 94 identified seven uh, dimensions of human security, and of course, emancipation. So uh, critical security studies examines how, given the diversity of threats, some threats or some issues become security, securitized, right? And some threats become seen as more important than other threats and dominate so-called uh, discourses of security. So importantly, the, the concept of human security sh shifts attention away from the state to the individual person. And the focus then becomes not so much the political sovereignty and territorial integrity of the state per se, but rather the, the, hum the human which uh, the state is supposed to protect human rights, uh, freedom from violence, sustainable development. So these are issues which I believe are quite uh, important and uh, are the core of the critical approach to security studies. So when it comes to CTS, right, which I consider to be a subset of a, a wider critical security approach, uh, I mean, there, there is a family resemblance, definitely. CTS claims that its analysis is both a theoretical commitment and a political orientation. So I underline political orientation because it's really at the heart of what I wanted to discuss for today. Uh, CTS, Critical Terrorism Studies, draws attention to the reality that the terrorism scholar can try to be as independently minded as possible and test for the robustness of findings based on uh, you know, looking at the data. But the basic problem is that terrorism studies is ineluctably political. This is a fair point, right? Uh, so CTS, to be fair, Right, has made an important and constructive contribution to the wider field of terrorism studies because it raises important questions which shouldn't be ignored. Like, for example, when terrorism scholars define like terms like terrorism, extremism, right? I mean, what do you mean? What are the, the, the influences? What are the, the factors that uh, drive their particular definitions of these terms, these very loaded terms, right? Uh, CTS draws attention to how rigorously certain concepts uh, uh, like these uh, terms, like terrorism, extremism, how they use, right? And how uh, the research is conducted. These, this, these are fair points, really. And I think, uh, basically, I would say that uh, CTS, because of its normative commitment, can keep MTS, the mainstream terrorism studies, honest, that's my phrase. Uh, CTS can help to keep MTS, uh, mainstream terrorism studies, honest, and offer labels and narratives that could provide a you know, more flexible and ethically responsible alternative to the, well, as what Jackson calls the oppressive confines or the discourse of Islamic terrorism, I would imagine you would consider any kind of uh, identity-based terrorism. So CTS, for instance, and I think this is a fair point, can call out terrorism scholars for deliberately excluding terrorist acts committed by the state from their research. So this is a point brought up by some scholars like Blakely. Uh, again, a fair point. So coming to the heart, of my remarks, right? So I really want to uh, engage with this issue. So to what extent is uh, critical terrorism studies really really a, a different paradigm, an alternative paradigm to mainstream terrorism studies, right? Okay, so first, I would say that, you know, coming from MTS, I, I think MTS scholars are generally aware of the need to be, you know, conscious of implicit political and ideological biases and to make the effort to ensure that the research process is not unduly influenced 
by these uh, you know background political and ideological biases. And I know this because it's really not a very new idea. Because George Orwell, back uh, in the uh, immediate post-war era, I mean, you know, he was saying that no, no writing is genuinely free from political bias and the desire to push the world in a certain direction exists in all writers. So, you know, we, 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 you know, we are aware of it. So we, we have to be aware of the, you know, that the research is not unduly influenced. Uh, second, uh, mainstream terrorism scholars are, you know, we, it's true that we look a lot at the, the state and particularly the kinetic operations of the state in counterterrorism operations. Uh, but it's also true, and I have to say this, that the MTS scholars are well aware of the need to examine the underlying social, political, and economic conditions that impact human security. This is not something which is uh, unknown, right? Uh, I mean, you know, we know that human security is a factor. If you don't have, if you have, def if you have deficits in human security, this is a risk factor for the rise of violent extremism. I mean, I come from Southeast Asia, I'm based in uh, Rajanatnam School in Singapore, and we have a very interesting uh, violent extremist threat picture in Southeast Asia. And I have to say that uh, mainstream scholars based in Southeast Asia have for years, right, discussed the need for so-called hard approaches to be meshed with softer approaches that deal comprehensively uh, with the well, the underlying conditions that give rise to the extremism in the first place, right? So, I mean, this quotation comes from CTTA, which refers to counter-terrorist tr uh, trends and analysis, which is the uh, publication of the International Center for Political Violence and Terrorism Research, ICPVTR, within the Rajaratnam School. I used to be head of that, right? So, uh, just to give you a flavor, Right, so a quotation from the, the latest uh, annual review uh, in January. In the 22, 2022 survey shows that much remains to be done to address structural grievances across the board. So in Pakistan, for example, the ethnic nationalist Baloch insurgency was center of gravity has shifted from the Baloch tribes to the educated tech and social media savvy youth for the urban middle class. It's very much driven by political marginalization and socioeconomic de uh, deprivation resulting in a more radical form of ballot nationalism. So, so right there, you see that there is an awareness within mainstream terrorism sc uh, scholars in Southeast Asia, certainly, that uh, human security uh, deficits, in this particular, particular case, political marginalization and social, social economic deprivation do give rise to uh, risk factors for violent extremism. So this is where, you know, I, I don't really see a very great deal of difference between what the critical terrorism studies scholars are saying and what the mainstream scholars are saying. You know, I, I think it's essentially a bit, fair bit of overlap to me. So, you know, uh, yet another factor, which I think is quite important really to, to, bring, to bring out here is that it is true that, uh, well, certainly in Southeast Asia, uh, MTS scholars often engage in research collaboration with and receive funding from the state. This however, does not imply that the mainstream scholars merely parrot state political and ideological agendas. I can tell you from personal experience, this is way too simplistic a description of the relationship, which can at times be pretty tense and marked by heated debates. It's, it's not uh, a, a one-way uh, street, you know. In fact, if, if anything, I would say that there's still insufficient, effective, and meaningful, well, Effective, I mean, it can be more effective. I think it's still insufficient effective engagement between uh, the mainstream terrorism uh, uh, policy community and state security intelligence agencies. Uh, again, not a new idea. Uh, well known terrorism scholar Mark Sageman mentioned in, uh, I think it was Terrorism and Political Violence from 2014. Uh, we have a, a quotation from Mark Sageman We have a system of terrorism research in which intelligence analysts know everything but understand nothing, while academics understand everything, but know nothing. So we need more productive interactions between the two communities. So I mean, some of you may know uh, uh, Mark Sageman, and uh, you know, sometimes he's pretty stark, right? But uh, I think what he says, that there is a kernel of truth in what he's trying to bring across here. The point is, there is room for uh, better uh, research uh, engagement and collaboration between the terrorism scholars, on one hand, and the 
security intelligence community who have all the live information and intelligence on, on the other. So it's not like, you know, it's a one-way street. I mean, there are, there are challenges facing this relationship. So the, the CTS view of the state and relationship with the analytical community, I think needs to be tweaked. Uh, and I have to say that uh, the CTS approach also kind of overstates the degree to which state implicated terrorism is let off the hook, so to speak, by the mainstream scholars. I mean, the role of the state in undermining human security is well known. Uh, although sometimes, you know, the actual term terrorism may not always be uh, used in the case of rogue governments that are oppressing their citizens. For example, J.M. Berger, in a very good book uh, from 2018 called Extremism, he doesn't use the term state terrorism, he uses the term state oppression, right? So it's, but, uh, I mean, it's not as, uh, uh, this is not an unknown. Uh, and so, but, but, but more than that, again, this is where I think there's really not a great deal of difference between the mainstream approach and the critical terrorism studies approach, because very often mainstream scholars do call out states when they go too far. So referring to, once again, the, uh, the latest uh, annual report or review of the Counter-Terrorist Trends and Analysis publication by uh, ICPWTRSIS, quotation uh, from uh, one of the scholars working on the Thai Deep South. So in the Thai Deep South, ongoing instances of Wisaman Katakam, which is a Thai term, meaning death at the hands of state officials who claim to have acted in the line of duty, quite clearly fomented Muslim discontent. So uh, mainstream scholars are aware and do call out instances where the state can, you know, should essentially uh, desist from such uh, uh, activities. Uh, the, the key, well, one of the key points I do want to bring up in the time available, well, time left is a, what I call the blurred boundaries problem facing uh, CTS. By its very nature, I think CTS is inherently ideological, right? As a field, it is significant, significantly influenced like critical security studies by postmodernist theoretical attitudes of you know, well-known uh, phrase, right? a hermeneutics of suspicion towards prevailing narratives and discourses. So Paul Ricoeur talked about this many years ago. In CTS, uh, scholars like Richard Jackson himself talks of the need to have a skeptical attitude towards accepted terrorism knowledge. So, okay, I mean, uh, in general, nothing wrong with that. I, I think that makes sense. You know, don't be too, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, gullible, you know, have a certain skepticism. Having said that, while a certain degree of skepticism is necessary for effective academic inquiry, as we all would agree, it can be taken too far, blurring the lines between objective detached scholarship and an ideological political activism with a view to effecting emancipatory change. So what I'm trying to say here is sometimes, you know, we as scholars, you know, we, we want to change so much that you know we sometimes uh, fall to the temptation of you know like uh, sculpt as what the British historian G. R. Elton says, sculpting the evidence rather than deriving from it. And this has happened. I've got a historian's background as well. And I can say you know certainly in uh, some of the research I've done on the, in the history uh, uh, space, this does happen. You know sometimes the line between the activism and the scholarship doesn't seem to be very clear. And so going back to CTS. My view, if I can put it uh, uh, humbly, right? If not careful, an excessive focus on the normative or ideological or political agenda can circumscribe the state action needed to bring about the very human security the CTS advocates are pushing for. So, I mean, if you really want to, to con constrain and, uh, you know, uh, draw a lot of uh, attention to the state, you know, we have to be careful that we don't, uh, circumscribe the state so much that they can't do the job, which, uh, which is essentially to defeat violent extremism and can also address the conditions that give rise to extremism. Go, look, going uh, to a Southeast Asian example again, I can see that in Mindanao, in Southern Philippines at the moment, armed forces of the Philippines is, uh, I would say, defeating the Islamist extremist threat groups kinetically. Uh, in the past couple of years, there have been several uh, mass surrenders of the, for example, the Abu Sayyaf group members. Uh, the other threat groups, the Maute group, uh, are also on the back foot, you know. Uh, so this is essentially a, a kinetic approach. But, you know, a kinetic 
approach doesn't necessarily have to be all problematic because in my view, a kinetic victory by the state can strengthen, certainly strengthen the basis for human security. I would argue that in the case of Mindanao, Southern Philippines, you need the state and the armed forces in particular before you can have human security and emancipation. So final point I'd like to bring up uh, on this uh, issue, broad issue is the, you see, because of this uh, approach and focus on a uh, hermeneutics of, of skepticism, it can, you know, if the mainstream scholars begin to like take this too, too, uh, you know, to uh, focus too much on it, it may inadvertently transform terrorism studies into what some scholars call a self-conscious peel of study exclusively studying itself. I mean, our definitions, our concepts, our purpose, you know, and this would, I mean, if you're big, if you're engaging too much academic navel gazing, you know, this would likely dilute the real world impact and policy relevance of the discipline of terrorism studies. I don't think anybody wants that, right? Professor so Rami, Professor Ramakrishna, sorry, yeah, oh, okay. you have two minutes. Yeah, last slide. So the key contribution of CTS is to remind MPS, right, that the terrorism scholar can try to be as independently minded as possible and test for the robustness of findings, et cetera. But, the, but ultimately, it is true. The, 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 the field is ineluctably political. So MTS uh, mainstream scholars must indeed be self-aware and uh, be aware of uh, the implicit uh, political biases and make an effort to correct for them, whilst at the same time grounding their scholarship on solid empirical research that is fully cognizant that a state-driven counterterrorism response has, it can't be the only response, it's got to be judiciously meshed with political, social, and economic initiatives that ultimately preserve human security, right? And CTS is correct in wanting to offer scholarship that promotes human security and emancipation of endangered communities. But again, I think that there's a need to guard against the temptation to allow the self-consciously ideological agenda of CTS to overpower the overriding need for objective detached scholarship. So, I mean, it's a temptation, right? Uh, before we speak truth to power, right, we have to be very sure that what we have as far as possible is indeed the truth based on uh, as objective and detached scholarship as possible. We, we must guard against the temptation to allow our activism to, to overpower uh, objective detached scholarship. Uh, so beyond that, uh, final few comments, it's hard to grasp to me the ways in which CTS really does provide an alternative paradigm of terrorism studies that is offered by the mainstream scholarship, I mean, open to you know, other views. The distinctively different value proposition that CTS offers, to me, is not very evident, right? So to me, I humbly say that you know, it makes a bit more sense to me for CTS to position itself as a valuable for sure and highly influential strain for sure, but within the overall ambit of terrorism studies rather than an alternative to it. So uh, with that, uh, I end my comments. Thanks very much. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect timing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the insightful presentation, Professor Ramakrishna. Uh, next, next, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Professor Charlotte Heath Kelly. Uh, she is a professor of politics and international studies at the University of Warwick in the UK. She is currently the principal investigator on a European Research Council starting grant. Um, which explores the, pr the proliferation of preventing and, counter and countering violent extremism programs in Europe and the merging of health and welfare logics within national security programs. She has published more than 20 academic papers as well as two monographs on themes related to political violence, including death and security, memory and mortality at the bomb site, published by Man Manchester University Press in 2017, and politics of violence, militancy, international politics, killing in the name by Rutledge 2013. Please, uh, you have the floor, thank you. Hi, um, before I can start, can anyone help me get my PowerPoint up? <laughs> okay, um, so that's half my time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
so yeah, I just wanted to start by by giving um, you know the warmest thanks to to the organisers for inviting me. Uh, it's it's a huge opportunity to to come to the golf for the first time. Um, so thank you very much. Um, it's been a wonderful event. So um, thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. And. Um, it's a little difficult to, to be asked to present the case for critical terrorism studies when one of the founders is in the audience. So <laughs> there are people in the audience who, who actually founded the school. So if any particularly difficult questions uh, need to be redirected, I will redirect them to the founder in question time. Um, and I think uh, Professor Ramakrishna did a great job. Um, I completely agree that, you know, I also treat this as an opportunity for a productive discussion. Um, and yeah, not at all worried about, you know, hearing critiques of critical terrorism studies. And indeed, I, I welcome them. Um, so with no further ado, I've been asked to present the case for critical terrorism studies. Um, and the structure of the presentation um, We'll largely start by looking at what is a critical approach, um, given that there are so many sort of critically named fields within sociology, within political science. Um, what is it that unites these different critical schools in all kinds of fields? Um, and then look specifically at critical approaches to terrorism and how they focus primarily on the study of, of counterterrorism in politics. Um, acknowledge some good points made by the case against. Indeed, um, Professor Ramakrishna and I are going to be quoting the same scholars at certain points, so we're, we're going to overlap significantly, and, and then finish with what I think are some of the achievements. I would like to take a deviation to begin, to, so that we can begin thinking about what a critical approach might be. This is an analogy that I find particularly helpful in the classroom. So I'm going to start with um, some philosophy of science. And Philosophy of science, science shows us very clearly that there is not one approach to understanding the world. Um, in school, we're all you know, educated in classical Newtonian mechanics, which, which maps sort of conventional understanding of natural laws, gravity, measurement, causation. This is what we're, we're taught in school. Um, and this intersects, of course, with the classical social sciences, sometimes called the traditional approaches, which measure causation. But then you get to university, um, or you, you end up reading Karen Barad like I did, because I was awful at science. And classical mechanics isn't the whole story. And it doesn't apply to all levels of reality. And quantum mechanics is fundamentally important to how we understand the world. And it upturns most of what we've been taught as science. So there's two completely different types of science out there that coexist harmoniously. And you can see this as the metaphor for where I'm going with the whole presentation. So in quantum mechanics, everything we think we know about measurement, causation, momentum has to be rethought. And really importantly, measurement becomes incredibly central here to understanding the process of measuring something. Because in quantum mechanics at the particle level, objects are either waves or particles or both simultaneously and they change when you measure them. So depending on how you look at them, and how you approach them, it is either a wave or a particle. It doesn't have one fixed form. So quantum mechanics, so as hard science as you can possibly get, understands that when you look at something, you change its fundamental nature. You change it either into a wave or a particle because you are not separate from the object. You are part of measuring it. And no one really understands why this happens. But when you measure the particle, you, you change it. So the process of, of measurement is entanglement, and it cannot be separated um, from, from this. So here we go as to why this is relevant. This is a metaphor. <laughs> uh, critical terrorism studies does not use quantum mechanics yet. I'm sure it will do one day. But it's a metaphor to help us understand what critical approaches do. So rather than try and measure causation, um, as a Newtonian approach would do, uh, critical approaches to security, to terrorism, to race studies, to geopolitics, they are united by this core understanding of that entanglement, that you, the researcher, are not separate from your environment. Your preconceptions, as much as you try to get rid of them, you will have preconceptions you don't know about. Um, this morning, a, a quote was uh, given to Thomas Schelling about how you absolutely can't write a list of things you don't expect. 
So this is the perfect sort of picture of this entanglement. We usually call this social uh, construction, um, and it looks at how um, social and political phenomena are not not really appropriate to be studied sometimes in the ways that natural phenomena are, because we are entangled with what we are studying. Uh, we're not external to it, we're not neutral. We are implicated uh, in its cultural, in cultural, linguistic, historical discourses. Um, and there are things we won't know to be careful about. You know, our preconceptions will always be with us. So we are entangled with what we study. This is what is central to a critical approach. And of course, we've had a lot about critical approaches to security, so I won't labor the point here. Um, but rather than focus on sort of causes of war questions, the, the critical approach to security um, looks at how threat is constructed, how that social construction is undertaken by political actors and for what ends. So I have a picture of Trump here, um, who after his incredibly racist discussion uh, of, of Mexicans uh, as you know, the famous speech, I don't really want to repeat any of it. He articulates his case for the presidency and uh, to rectify this problem, he's going to build a great wall, a great wall on the southern border of the United States. And what you have here for critical approaches to security is a, is a wonderful example of someone constructing a threat, constructing an outside um, that threatens the inside, and in doing so, positions themselves as the defender. So a very political speech, a very political moment where an outside threat is, is constructed in order to make political work happen. So um, security language is not neutral and it serves the ends of those who use it and it's primarily, in our field at least, it justifies extraordinary measures. Um, that'll do for critical approaches to security. So to come to critical approaches uh, to terrorism, this was... Um, this was a companion project to uh, the Welsh School of, of Critical Security Studies. Uh, in its original form, it was set up in a small Welsh town called Aberystwyth. Um, and it was set up during the early war on terror to problematize the kinds of political transformation that were happening at that time. And it was motivated by significant concern about the political use of terrorism language um, to justify overseas wars the human rights um, abrogation that was going on at the time, um, sort of removing Geneva Convention being a huge uh, example of this um, when, uh, yes, when Bush was um, basically justifying doing anything to people he would consider enemy combatants and they didn't deserve any rights. Um, and also motivated by uh, the damage to civil liberties that was uh, coming about domestically in, in the West as a result of this sort of turn to a war on terrorism. So this is primarily not a study of what causes terrorist attacks. Um, this is very much about entanglement with the object that we study. It's very much about social construction. So the critical approach to terrorism uh, studies how, for example, um, how the language of axis of evil, religious terrorism, foreign fighters, extremism, how these lead to real world consequences, how they are constructions of language that justify real world events, um, really serious ones such as extraordinary rendition, um, the abrogation of rights so that you know people can be imprisoned without end in Guantanamo Bay, uh, drone wars, extrajudicial assassination, um, and really significant deviations from liberal democratic norms that we might have hoped would have hold solid. So it's more in some ways, it's more of a study of counter-terrorism than it is a study of terrorism. Um, and it's, it's got a predominant focus on questions of how, how, this, how these things happen, how language works to, um, to alter the world politically, rather than questions of causation or why did this happen. So I want to acknowledge some good points made by the case against um, everything Professor Ramakrishna said, of course. Um, there's also uh, early articles that directly made the case against the Critical Terrorism Studies School. Um, and they, they point to, to several problems, such as uh, the Frankfurt School sort of theoretical approach in the original Critical Terrorism Studies School. Um, it is, it's quite an idiosyncratic sort of school of thought, and it's, it really doesn't make up the majority of Critical Terrorism Studies research. 
Um, I'm taking a broad interpretation of what is pu published in the journals, what happens at the working group conferences, rather than the textbooks themselves. So, you know, I'm, I myself have reservations about the concept of emancipation as it's thought through Frankfurt School critical theory. Um, it does it does worry me, sort of the construction of emancipation, and, and even Jeroen was, was talking about how um, it's a product of sort of, you know, the Enlightenment era, uh, and therefore, by essence, it's a product of coloniality. It's, it's got to be treated carefully, that concept. Um, the second point, it does do quite a lot of um, its own boundary drawing as a project with orthodox terrorism studies. Um, Professor Ramakrishna talked about how mainstream terrorism studies does do, you know, so a lot of self-reflection. It does, it is aware sometimes of the political nature of the field that it studies. Um, and I also want to quote Sageman at this point in that he's not a, he's not a critical scholar by name. He doesn't position himself in the critical terrorism school, but his book, Misunderstanding Terrorism, is a wonderful book, and I urge you to read it. Uh, it's partly a quantitative book, it does statistical analysis, uh, but he uses it to absolutely rubbish the understanding of radicalization discourse, of a, of a program that could identify in advance people who might become terrorists in the future. So he does a wonderful deconstruction of these programs uh, by using very traditional uh, quantitative methods. And it's, yeah, it's, it's really excellent work. So the boundary between the two schools, you know, it shouldn't be understood as, as hard or fixed. It's quite porous. So what are the achievements of critical terrorism studies? I think it's, um, it's done some wonderful work in three main areas that I picked out. Um, it's done excellent work sort of bringing together the critical geopolitics scholars on understanding uh, sort of the mid-war on terror, if we want to call it that, where drone warfare became a really uh, pressing concern in, the, in global politics. And so there's quite a significant trajectory of research looking at how on earth it came about that war could be undertaken by robots at a distance of thousands of miles to, to bomb you know, cars, people of military age, and to frame them as targets and then enable sort of an unmanned drone to, uh, to you know, fire a missile at them. This is a very unique kind of 21st century type of um, rendering of space is completely without rights, completely without law, such that a, a power thousands of miles away can simply identify a car as suspicious and, and explode it and everyone inside it. So there's been some great work on the technological aspects of that and how technology is employed to, to develop the sphere of warfare, but also on the, the linguistic um, terms that are used to justify uh, this kind of drone warfare. Um, Places are never, it's never, places are never described as political communities. People are never described as civilians in this literature. Um, country names are rarely used. Instead, there's abbreviations used like uh, FATA, feder federally administrated tribal areas. Um, so there's a lot of work on how the language used by political figures um, contributes to the exceptional sort of violence of drone warfare. So that's one area where I think achievements have been, have been made. There's also um, a really strong current of research into terms like extremism and radicalization and what they are doing, sort of taking over international space, um, almost inventing a process whereby states can now work to identify people preemptively who might be on a course towards terrorism. And a lot of this knowledge, of course, is not scientifically valid. Um, I can take the questions on that if you want as to where these risk assessments come from, but I promise there's not much there in terms of their scientific validity. And so the study of these terms looks at why they're so phenomenally successful, uh, why international organizations are so keen to take them up, uh, and how problematic some of these programs are from a civil liberties and free speech kind of perspective. And finally, most recently, when I've attended the conferences um, of the Critical Terrorism Studies School, uh, I've noticed a real turn away from discourse analysis towards um, questions of decoloniality, questions of critical race theory. 
looking at how concepts of coloniality are you know embedded in uh, the fight against terrorism but but also scholarship on te terrorism um, some recent work by Alice Martini is fantastic on this looking at how UN debates when they're talking about terrorism when they're talking about radicalization they're never talking about the far right um, despite the fact that this is a significant problem in many countries they never talk about the far right and why is this so these are the three areas where I think there's been particular advance in research in this field. Um, how long do I have left? Four minutes, okay. I'll tell you a little bit. Um, <laughs> so what fascinates me at the moment and why I think critical terrorism studies is just such a productive um, approach to use is that it allows you to do um, some very strange, interesting research. Um, for instance, what I'm working on at the moment is the question of psychiatry's involvement in terrorism prevention. And you may not know, it's a fascinating story, but 40 years ago, there was an enormous inter international political uh, argument between the Soviet Union and uh, the countries of Western Europe and the United States. And it was based around how psychiatry should be used. And at the time, the Soviet Union was using psychiatry to diagnose democracy activists as extremists. Um, and then in collaboration with the KGB, to put them in hospital detention because of their extreme uh, political views, such as support for democracy. So this was a massive human rights abuse. But it did involve a pathologization of the democracy activists as having sluggish schizophrenia which is a really interesting diagnosis. Now, why, why on earth am I talking about this? Well, because in 40 years time, you know, the US and the UK led an enormous campaign in psychiatry um, professional associations to condemn this and to you know, establish ethical standards that you cannot use medicine for a security goal. You, know, you can't use it for an intelligence goal. It should be separate. It should be, you know, it should be done for medicine's sake alone. 40 years later, that's exactly what's happening in Western Europe. So the discourse of radicalization has developed in such a medicalized direction that intelligence agencies in Norway and the United Kingdom are now putting people in the hospital, not because um, their conditions have worsened or because you know, on medical grounds alone they might need more treatment. It's happening because they're diagnosed as having an extremist kind of tendency of thought um, and that they might be on the brink of committing an attack, but the security services can't rest you really on that basis for very long. So rather than put them in prison, they're put in a psychiatric hospital. So you have kind of parallel processes 40 years apart, which shouldn't be possible if, you know, liberal democracy stuck to its um, stated sort of rules and goals, but it hasn't. So CTS helps us uncover these really fluid boundaries between political ideologies, between care and national security, and the real movement that can occur in how a state behaves, um, how it uses certain programs, to the point that it's undertaking really quite repressive um, actions that 40 years ago it condemned. Time to conclude. So I'm gonna conclude in pretty much exactly the same way as Professor Ramakrishna. Um, in that my contention is that you know critical terrorism studies is not supposed to replace mainstream terrorism studies. It's it does come a very different uh, type of research, uh, as different probably as Newtonian and quantum mechanics. So critical studies is um, a very different project that should be understood to balance mainstream terrorism studies. Uh, it's much more about how politics uses terrorism language, how it uses terrorism as a justification to expand certain programs, certain influences. Um, it's not supposed to replace the mainstream study of, of political violence at all. Um, and to use a quote from the original case against, uh, it's best to let a thousand flowers bloom and the two can peacefully coexist. Um, and that's, that's the end of my time. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Professor.
Thank you very much, Professor he, uh, Heath Kelly. I really like the reference to quantum physics. <laughs> so I really like. Thanks. Now allow me to present our next speaker, Dr. Aaron Zellin. Dr. Zellin is the Richard Borrow uh, Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East and Policy and a visiting research scholar in the Department of Politics at Brandeis University and the founder of jihadology.net. His research focuses on Sunni Arab jihadi groups in North Africa and Syria, as well as the trend of uh, foreign fighting, online jihadism, and jihadi governance. He is currently working on his third book for Cambridge University Press, titled Heartland of the Believers, A History of Syrian Jihadism. He is the, he's the author of Your Sons Are at Your Service, Tunisia's Missionaries of Jihad. It's published by Columbia University Press in 2020, and The Age of Political Jihadism, a, a study of Hayat, al -tahri, of Hayat Tahrir al-Sham. And now uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Thanks so much. Um, I hope everybody's uh, food coma for lunch has waned a little bit. Um, so today I wanted to explore an interesting topic related to groups that have been seen as terrorism threats over the last 20 years, now transforming in some ways, going against other terrorist groups as state actors. It's a unique um, situation because there really hasn't been too many cases historically of something along those lines. And I'll get a little bit into how that is. Of course, states have dealt with terrorism in many different cases, but I'm talking about groups that become states and then right away have to deal with some form of terrorism issue. Um, I first really started to notice this when Hayat Tahrir al-Sham uh, in Syria, Northwest Syria, took over the area and essentially had to deal with the problem of ISIS trying to conduct attacks in its area and to secure the location as well. And I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, but then once the Taliban took over uh, Afghanistan again, you started to see something similar play out. Um, and I think in this case, it's it's far more interesting on some level because they control the entire country versus HTS just controlling a small pocket. And therefore, it's a much greater challenge in some ways. Um, you know, Stathos's presentation really gave me some food for thought in the way I frame it. I come from more of a qualitative, descriptive analysis background. So I think, you know, when we're talking about the state of the field, one thing, uh, you know, that I think is important as ever is also remembering on, on both sides, both people focusing on theory and both people focusing more on like qualitative type of research, that it's important to see each other's research and meld them together on some level because it improves it over time. Um, uh, so this, of course, is a very iterative process too, I'd argue. This is the first time I'm talking about this. So I'm learning just as much as well as questions you might have for me that might help sharpen it when I hopefully provide the final uh, version of this paper. So one of the things that I think is interesting to think about is sort of this paradigm shift, not only in terms of what I'm talking about related to HTS and the Taliban, but also just the general global security environment in the way that it's framed from you know, the US, which has been the dominant power, obviously, since the end of the Cold War, and how that's now being challenged and how that then changes the focus in the US on these terrorism issues, which became so large scale after what happened on 9-11. You know, at that time, there was just such a zeroing in on that issue of Al-Qaeda at the time, and then obviously grew to ISIS as well as any related movements. But there's been much less focus on counterterrorism and jihadi groups in general. Obviously, the US still has operations against them. Um, but the resources towards it is much less than it had been previously. And I think after many uh, failed attempts at dealing with the issue over the last 20 plus years, there's been more of a right sizing of the issue. I'm sure that there are still criticisms of the way that the US goes about what it does, um, as well as its allies. Um, but I think it's in a much better place now than say it was you know, 20 years ago when the US is just going in and invading Afghanistan, invading Iraq, even though Iraq had really nothing to do um, with uh, Al Qaeda or 9-11. Um, so as a consequence, um, 
there's more focus on other issues, whether it's power competition, whether it's the rise in far-right extremism within the US, within the West in general. Um, and because of this, this has also given space for these jihadi groups that are just focused locally and not interested in doing attacks abroad to do these state building projects. Um, and I think this is also another, you know, critique I generally have of, you know, people that focus on just terrorism studies as is, is that it's just focused on the violent aspects of these movements when I'd argue the, the, the groups and have so much more going on than just the violence in terms of what they're involved in, whether it's in terms of education, whether it's in terms of outreach and professionalization, whether it's in terms of their ideologies, whether it's in terms of governance and social services or these proto-state activities. Um, and therefore, we're in a different scene now where these groups are able to play out what they've been trying to attempt to do in a way that we haven't really seen before. Going back to when these movements really started to push for this back in the 1960s and 70s. Um, so I don't need to really <laughs> explain to you that the Taliban was involved in terrorism prior to them taking over the country, but just to reiterate the point, here's some examples from the five years prior to the Doha Agreement. After the Doha Agreement with the US, the really the Taliban really wasn't involved in terrorism since you know they've taken over the state. They haven't been involved in terrorism. Um, you know, they've been obviously involved in human rights abuses and they're an authoritarian government, but I think those are different questions than the issue of terrorism in of itself. So I just wanted to talk about some other potential cases maybe that could be relevant related to this issue. If anybody else has any other examples, I'd love to hear it. Um, this is based off of just some general research that, you know, a group of people involved in insurgency or terrorism then took over a state and then right away had to deal with their own terrorist or insurgent type of activity, whether it was the so-called patriots when the US was fighting against the British and then there was a whiskey rebellion right afterwards and these guys were involved in some level of terrorism, free Irish state taking on the anti-treaty IRA, um, you know, elements of what became the IDF previously, the Ergun and Lehi, but not the Haganah were involved in terrorism against the British as well as uh, the Arabs in the Palestinian territories. And then right away I had to deal with a bunch of different groups that they still on some level are dealing with. Obviously, it's changed over the last 70 or 80 years, though. And then the case of the Sandinistas taking over and then dealing with the Contras. Obviously, now we're talking about HTS and ISIS as well as the, the Taliban and ISIS. Um, but one of the interesting things, though, if you note comparing those prior cases to what we're seeing now, is that while maybe you could say in, in the 1970s there were some international security elements to Palestinians hijacking planes and the like, but overall, much of that previously was localized to those particular contexts, whereas what's going on with HTS and the Taliban and ISIS, it's a very much transnational problem that countries all over the world are worried about. Um, so it takes on a different uh, framework. Um, and just to highlight the case of HTS briefly, because I think it's important, they actually see the Taliban as a model. So it's also important to see how, why I'm also connecting these two issues. Um, HTS has been in control of the area in Northwest Syria, Northern Idlib, Western Aleppo since July, 2017. And they've taken down 59 ISIS cells since then. And there actually has not been a successful ISIS attack in HTS territory going back to July, 2018. Um, obviously <laughs> two of ISIS's leaders though were not captured, but they blew themselves up before the US could capture them in two raids in 2019 and 2022, which illustrates some of the limitations of what they can do. Part of that is just the capacities and capabilities, I think. I don't think that they knew that they were there. If they were there, I think HTS would have gone after them. Um, but it does illustrate some limitations that I'll also discuss later on related to the Taliban and its campaign against ISIS. So just to give a little background, there was a bunch of defections from a number of individuals in the or Kazai uh, chapter of the Tariqi Taliban Pakistan or the TTP, as well as extremist Salafis in Afghanistan, as well as some people that had previously been a part of the Afghan Taliban. Um, they pledged Baya to, at the time, ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, and they joined ISIS in January 2015. At first, they're mainly based in Nangarhar, Afghanistan in the beginning, um, and then later co-opted other extremist elements in Lashkri Jangvi and the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan. Um, Mainly their issue with the Taliban was that they allegedly were working with Pakistan and Iran. Pakistan, probably likely, uh, Iran, probably not so much. Um, 
And then they also had an issue with the Taliban's relationship historically with Al-Qaeda, because the context of this is that there's been this sort of uh, competition between Al-Qaeda and ISIS going back to when ISIS split from Al-Qaeda in April 2013, which first happened in the Syrian-Iraqi context. Um, the group ISIS in Afghanistan and Pakistan slowly built up its capabilities from 2015 through 17, and then slowly started to get more and more violent over time. Um, and the dates here I, I did is because the Taliban took over, obviously, in August 15, 2021. So I want to sort of give it a lead up. So then when I provide the statistics about after the Taliban took over, it would be synchronized. Um, but you could see that it really went up. 1920, it went down because there was more of a concerted effort by the US, ISAF, and the Taliban itself to go after them. There was actually a joke, I think, from some US official claiming that the US was the Taliban's air force. Obviously, it was tongue in cheek. Um, but for a time, they're able to suppress it a little bit. Obviously, it's still 157 attacks. It went back up again, in part because there was a leadership decapitation. The new leader really got them back on their feet. So that brings us to the fall of Kabul in uh, mid-August 2021. Since then, you know, the attacks went up in the first year a little bit, um, but it was relatively stable. Part of that I'd attribute to, you know, the political transition between what was before and what was coming after, and the Taliban being interested in securing their place as the leaders. Um, but if you actually look at the six months since the second year started, there have only been set 47 attacks so far, which would suggest it's on pace at least for 94 right now, which is a huge drop off, which we really haven't seen since um, ISIS uh, started its activities in Afghanistan. Another anecdotal thing, um, you know, it's hard to measure this, but something that uh, I found interesting is if you look at ISIS Bayat campaigns, which essentially whenever their leader uh, dies, there has to be a pledge of Bayat to the new leader. Um, and they then put out a series of pictures and videos to, you know, for their own propaganda. And one of the interesting things is after Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was killed uh, in this you saw 135 individuals, then when Abu Ibrahim al-Hashimi al-Qurashi died, uh, 92, and then the most recent with Abu Hassan al-Hashimi al-Qurashi, only 66, which was, you know, the other month. I don't, you know, anecdotal, but it is interesting that you do see this trend. Um, and when you compare it to the other, you know, so-called wilayat or provinces of ISIS, um, you know, it goes up and down depending on which one, but you know, if you look at the case of Wilayat Gharb Ifriqiya, which is the West Africa province, mainly Nigeria, you've seen a huge growth in the number of figures between 2019 and now um, during these campaigns. So the way that the Taliban has tried to deal with it is through their director of, Directorate of Intelligence, um, which was set up in October 2021. Here's the original statement, the original in Pashto, but also in English, since I'm guessing most people don't know Pashto. Um, but essentially, most people uh, that they're focusing on is the Khwarij cells, which is ISIS. They see them as, you know, just like the original extremists within Islam. Also, kidnappers, smugglers, drug dealers, and what they claim is mafia. I'm not really quite sure what they're referring to there. Um, but since uh, July 2022, when they announced their first arrests related to ISKP activity within Afghanistan, uh, it's happened 17 times. One of the interesting things is a consequence of... Um, their campaign against ISIS in Afghanistan is that it's become less of a rural issue in different parts of the country and more focused on Kabul um, in terms of what ISIS attacks have done. Obviously, there are still attacks elsewhere, but you've really seen it as, as a way because ISIS is trying to undermine the Taliban's push for international legitimacy. And just to give an example, I, I previously wrote an article. This came out uh, August uh, 15, 2022, looking at the Taliban's diplomatic engagements with different countries over the first year. Of course, the numbers have gone up over the last six months, almost about double, um, which illustrates that even though the Taliban's Islamic Emirate is not officially recognized by any country, they're still very much, you know, talking to and working with many countries globally. Um, so because of this, you know, it's part of the reason why ISIS views them as a problem. And this was, um, you know, encompassed in uh, an editorial that they put out uh, in early September last year, calling uh, the Taliban essentially the Emirate of Embassies. 
Um, interestingly enough, a few weeks after the article I wrote about their diplomatic engagements, I don't know if there's any connection, but you never know, um, because these guys do uh, look at what other analysts write about them. Um, and as a consequence, we've seen, you know, on the left hand side, uh, for people that don't know Arabic, it's claiming responsibility for an attack on a Russian embassy. Um, the one next to that is a hotel that has a lot of Chinese diplomats as well as businessmen that usually go there when they're trying to have dealings with the Taliban's government. Um, and it's increasingly become an issue within not only the propaganda of ISIS, but the way that they try and actualize this on the ground. Just to get an idea of this, you know, form of uh, CT and the types of arrests, this is different than sort of the intercommunal violence, you know, that was alluded to earlier, where it's just fighting between the two groups, where this is more of a traditional type of, you know, campaign that you would see by law enforcement or intelligence officials in any other country, whether it's, you know, related to ISIS recruiting online, you know, the procurement of fake uh, IDs, birth certificates, you know, the development of propaganda, going after people after an attack to try and get the network of the cells, different financing schemes. Interestingly enough, they claim that they caught somebody that was getting money from Ukraine, Germany, and Spain. I have no way of knowing if this is true or not, of course, um, but I thought it was interesting to note, um, you know, safe house provisions, weapons procurement, as well as just for being a member of ISIS in general. And one of the interesting things as the Taliban has gone after ISIS is that there's been also not only the focus on, you know, the diplomatic engagements within Kabul and the greater presence of foreign governments there, um, but also because maybe they don't have the same capacities to operate in Afghanistan in the same way that they might have had before, is that they're pushing towards external operations in a way we haven't really seen from other um, ISIS branches since IS and Syria and Iraq were doing this from like 2014 to 17, 18 time period. Whether it's the production of propaganda in a number of languages, you know, the, the three things on top is the English, Pashto, and Arabic versions of their Voice of Khorasan uh, magazine, which they put out every couple of weeks or so, as well as threats to neighboring countries regionally, um, whether it's cross-border rocket attacks against Uzbekistan or Tajikistan, or more recently, external operation attempts in both Iran and Turkey. Of course, we saw the attack in Shiraz, Iran in October last year. That actually had a connection to ISKP. Um, and then there's been a number of attempts in Turkey as well. Just to give an idea over the last few months, because it, it really hasn't been a trend until the last few months or so where we've noticed that operatives related to ISKP getting caught in different countries. You know, the network was rolled up in Iran after the Shiraz attacks, but there's been a number of cases as you can see in Turkey. And then there's actually recently just, you know, about 10 days ago, a financing case in uh, Pakistan also related to trying to help fund ISKP's activities there. So, you know, going back to the beginning when I talked about the potential limitations of this, of course, it's, uh, you know, fascinating phenomenon that they're going after ISIS, but there are other, you know, groups that other countries would deem terrorists as well that they're kind of ignoring. On the one hand, there's still Al Qaeda elements in Afghanistan, problem for the US, there's the Tariqi Taliban Pakistan or the TTP. Huge problem increasingly for the Pakistani government. Um, and then there's the Turkestan Islamic Party, which is the main group of Uyghurs that have left uh, Xinjiang and China. And China obviously is deeply concerned with this issue. Then there's the case of what happened when the US uh, killed Ayman al Zawahri, the former leader of Al Qaeda, and that, you know, allegedly he was staying at the home owned by a top aide of Siraj Din al Haqqani, who's the ministry, Minister of Interior of the Islamic Emirate. So it creates a lot of complications related to this issue. Um, you know, it reminds me of the fact, though, that, you know, just obviously totally different contexts, different scenarios, but it's in the same way, way that you'll see um, where, say, in a Western country, maybe a political party plays footsie with more extremist elements within their base and they're involved in violence, too. They don't want to necessarily go after them or maybe they push them on, Republican Party in the US. Um, but uh, you could see what I'm trying to say here. But one of the biggest questions going forward, though, when you look at this issue, is that because ISKP might, you know, have more ambitions abroad, because they might be more 
constrained locally, what does that mean if they are able to successfully do some large scale attack in China, Russia, India, you know, Western country, or let's say the TTP maybe becomes a larger problem for Pakistan as it increasingly becomes more and more violent in different parts of the country. And what the Pakistani government does, which is interesting since, you know, the Pakistani government in many ways has been a key patron of the Afghan Taliban going back to the 1990s. Um, uh, so uh, there's a lot going on, but it's, it's definitely an interesting scenario that's being played out that I don't think people are particularly looking at that study these groups. I think part of it is because it kind of melts people's minds when they're like, wait, there's jihadi groups involved in counterterrorism too, on some level. Um, and just totally breaks the paradigms that have been discussed and talked about over the last 20 years. So I thought it'd be an interesting case to d discuss at least some inchoate thoughts related to this, uh, today. So thank you. Sorry, sorry, the IT oh. folks. Thank you very much, Dr. Zellen. Now, uh, last but not least, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Marjana Zakwaska. Marjana Zakwaska. She is an associate professor at the Faculty of National Security and Director of Global Affairs and Diplomacy Studies at the War Studies University in Warsaw, Poland and also chair of the War Studies Working Group at the International Society of Military Sciences. She holds a PhD in security science from the National Defense University in Warsaw. Her professional associations include the Academy for International Conflict Management and Peace Building, and the United States Institute of Peace in Washington, DC. She is also a research fellow at the Royal Military College of Canada and the US Army War College. As an editor and an author, she has published books and articles on armed conflicts, hybrid threats, social security issues, and strategic games. The floor is yours, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this means what I have a little bit more time, yes? Yes, oh, yeah. uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today and also great honor. And at first I would like to thank you very much uh, for inviting me here. And my big thanks going to uh, Professor Omar Ashar. Thank you, Professor. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, today I would like to talk about sensitive issue, and of course this is the state-sponsored insurance and the case which I will uh, provide here and I will show my study is based on the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, in particular I will focus on the eastern part of Ukraine. Uh, I would like to mention where I will present my research based on the research outcome which was developed uh, during the project I conduct with Professor Rari Goodson from U.S. Army War College. Uh, the project is dedicated to Russia hybrid warfare and we ask in uh, this project, we ask for the research question that Russia hybrid warfare may change it. And having this in mind, uh, I would like to present a few topics. First is the concept of hybrid warfare, how we understand the hybrid warfare. Uh, the other topic is why Russia sponsor the separatist mo movement. Also, I would like to uh, bring you a little bit, maybe not knowledge, but wider perspective how we understand the separatist movement in Ukraine, what kind of groups are involved, what is the support which Russia offers for the separatist movement, and my conclusion is concept, how Russia organized the separatist movement and how Russia used the separatist movement to achieve national interests. Okay, having this in mind, let's start. Ladies and gentlemen, um, concept, hybrid warfare. 
When we're going to hybrid warfare, the most important word is understand this is what this war and of course how war is changing to the phase which we have right now would mean hybrid warfare. We uh, discussed with Professor Olare Gutson few different concepts, and as folks you know, as many different definitions of the war and uh, hybrid warfare too. But we choose the main authors, main writers who put foundation of understanding the war and hybrid warfare. Some of them probably is very well known to you, but let me bring just in case the main idea. And first is Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu, who mentioned where wagging the war is based on use conventional and non-conventional method. Conventional and non-conventional, very much important. The other most favor for uh, Professor Lale Gutson, this means Cartier, he emphasized on the nature and character of the warfare. He pointed out where warfare has dynamic nature and that's why he developed four different forms of, of war. And of course, um, uh, also Klausiewicz, which he mentioned that war is the tool, the tool to achieve the national interest, the tool to imply the state policy, extremely important. So this is the framework, the framework for understanding the war and the base for understanding the hybrid warfare. Going further, we do have the modern stage of the concept of hybrid warfare, which brought for us Frank Hoffman. Frank Hoffman, he emphasized on three things. The first, of course, using conventional and non-conventional weapons. The other things, which is very important for us, what he mentioned where all this means can be used simultaneously, extremely important, different dimension, the same time, the same area. And the other thing which he pointed out, he mentioned where we should be aware where in hybrid warfare we meet many different actors, so it's not just state. And here actually we refer to terrorist group, to separate this group as well. And I would like to also uh, give you a little bit scope on the new concept which developed Professor Larry Goodson. He pointed out where the hybrid warfare we should understand more practical way. What does mean practical way? We should focus on the tactics, on the means, which are particular use in wagging the war. Ladies and gentlemen, because we, I don't want to go over the time, but some of the tactics are listed on the slide. I'll be very happy to share with you my presentation for all of you who would like to get more familiar with the concept. And where the question what I would like to ask I ask myself, but this is also a question for all of us for future discussion. So why Russia support separatist movement, particular in Ukraine? And going with that to find the answer, we should also understand Russia's strategy in this war, yes? And this is the several main points which create Russia's strategy, the grand strategy. And first, as you ladies and gentlemen notice, where the main idea is, of course, stop the NATO expansion, the eastward expansion, where now we have the case of Ukraine, but let's also remember about the situation which we have in 2008 regarding Georgia, of course, yes. And the other part is, in this strategy, is protecting Russian citizens, the, not just citizens who live in Russia, but the citizens who are living abroad. And this is the concept of Ruski Mir, ladies and gentlemen. So Russia, Russia who, which is the center of Slavic world, the Slavic world which is understood by unity of all people who present the same identity as far as the culture, the religion, of course, the identity which is very close to Russian style of tradition and culture, extremely important, yes. 
The other part which I would like to point out, this is using in Russia policy and not just the policy, let's call it interstate policy, but I'm talking about the foreigner policy, the non-conventional and conventional tools. And now we go back to that. Well, we do have also the other points, which is of course control of Black Sea relating to Crimea issue and seeking warm water pattern. Ladies and gentlemen, um, Ruski Mir, um, the concept is well known, but what I would like to highlight, which is extremely important regarding the separatist movement. Because of this concept, Russia strong su supports separatist movement, and this concept Russia using to justify annexation of territory. So, well, the annexation of territory, I will talk about this lately, become like policy, the new policy, how to sizing the territory, become very important new tools, among other, which Russia using, and what we call hybrid tools. Well, ladies and gentlemen, wagging war, this is also some foundation, some concept. Well, we can say the doctrine, of course, Russia doesn't have any official documents which will call census-stricted doctrine and describe how we're wagging the war. But anyway, we may point out very important concept which is very useful by Russia and we may find extremely related idea using in this concept based on analyze the Russian policy. And this is the concept, this is uh, Ms., uh, Mr. General uh, Gerasimov, who mentioned where working modern war, the same creating by Russia, the foreign policy is based on using conventional and non-conventional measures. I would like to point out for this non-conventional measure because this is important part. When you see folks, non-military non action, you may see use of little green men, proxy wars, criminal networks. All these groups is very easy to turn to be separatist forces. This is what we, I fortunately experience and observe in Ukraine. Well, this concept, um, in my view, Russia built by the experience of previous engagement in the war in 20 in 21 century. And when you folks analyze this war, you may see a few things. Please take a look. Second Chechenia War, Little Green Man, yes, criminal network, Menchadars, Georgia War. Pretty much the same, cyber, um, um, mostly uh, using the uh, cyber activities, but also in Georgia war, a lot about the criminal networking organization. In Syria war, pretty much the same. The other part which I would like to point out, this is another experience, how Russian leadership use the hybrid action. And ladies and gentlemen, here I would like to emphasize on the criminal activities, which is for sure assassination, which the assassination which we observe and is widespread by the separatist group in Ukraine. I'm talking about assassination, which took also form of genocide, yes? mass graves, we, we have been witness all this development which happened in last year. Ladies and gentlemen, so how this start? This is the question, how this separatist movement was organized in Russia. And please be aware where this is not just usually point by us the Crimea situation, yes, Crimea issue. This started a little bit early. The separatist movement, to, to organize separatist movement, this is the uh, time after the revolution of dignity and Euromaidan, which also spread anti new Ukraine protest, demonstration, and pro Russian demonstration. This was built the pro-Russian groups, and the groups was built 
in south part of Ukraine and also in the east part in the Ukraine. And we know very well the case of Crimea. And in my point of view, we may say where this is the beginning, of course, of start the separatist movement. And the separatist movement, which doesn't have, it, which is not built in the form as we well know, like or groups, armed groups, but the separatist movement which is built by civilian groups. So this means where people, civilian, who would like to be part of Russia, who make strong statement where don't, they don't want to be any more part of Ukraine. And this is very interesting thing. The other thing which I will say were, is coming here with separatist movement and take a little bit different form, this is also the little green man, yes, as maybe different form of separatist group which folks represent here and were so far as well known to us. So Donbass region, Donbass region pretty much the same, but better organized, more structured separatist group. We may see where these separatist groups are the fighters, yes, they participate in the combat fighting and they have strong support from Russia. So, well, we, we may uh, see the support, how they start the support, ladies and gentlemen, you for sure remember the so-called humanitarian aid convoy, which was um, organized and smoothly moved to Ukraine in August 2014. The consequence of this all ongoing action, of course, which I call the first stage of the Russian war, it was frozen conflict. And the conflict which characterized here in this form were the low level of hostility. But ladies and gentlemen, let's take a look further. So we do have the separatist groups. They are already organized, they are armed, they are supported by Russia. And because of the, the action of the, or the separatist movement, because of the behavior of this group, the direct involvement in the combat against uh, Ukrainian government, we do have the another form which coming of as hybrid tools, which I mentioned already, the annexation. The annexation of Crimea, which started, of course, in March 2014, but, well, progress and further progress, and we do have the annexation, I will call so far, so far, the um, kind of progressive stage of annexation, which ex we experience and we observe, in last September 2022, after the invasion, which uh, Russia started in February 2002. I'm talking about progressive annexation of next region, and now we're facing where Russia annex, of course, Crimea, Lutansk, Donetsk, Zaporozhye, and Kherson. So this is also showing us how progressive stage has the separatist movement, yes? Where this is not just phenomena which is ongoing in particular small region of this country. And this make me aware what is next. Who are the separatists? Um, where by, by on the research, uh, we do have different groups, as you folks noticed, this is militia. Uh, this is also the security forces, which Ukrainian uh, security forces, which sympathize with the pro-Russian separatists. Uh, this is, uh, of course, the uh, voluntary uh, forces, the Caucasian and Central Asia, armed group, etc. 
uh, how looks the separatist forces. This is some example um, in the Donetsk People of Republic. You may see where the structure is very complex and we have regular forces, we have special forces, we have real forces, territorial defense. Similar structure we have on the separatist forces in the uh, Lutansk people um, a republic. And ladies and gentlemen, of course the separatist forces are supported by the private military companies, many different for many different organizations. One of very well known for you is the Wagner groups. Um, this is this is some um, information how Russia also used the private military company and give us a little bit wider wider view on this uh, particular uh, element and tactics, of course, in the wagging the war. And as folks, you may see how many the private military company was used in Syria. And of course, pretty much similar situation, if not progressive, we have in Ukraine. Okay, two minutes. Um, equipment, weapon, and ammunition. And this is the support which they're getting from Russia of the equipment of the troops and of training as well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the war is, of course, uh, to support separatist movement. This is costly. I listed here some costs. You are very welcome to get better look on that. Financial support, just want to let you know where Russia overcame the sanction and by transfer also um, financial support from the bank in South Ossetia, Russia support the separatist movement. Well, this is what I mentioned, uh, the narration in media, Russia uh, understand this, the separatist movement as the supporters of the federalization. So this is not terrorist. This is supporters of federalization. Very interesting, yes? Huge difference, huge difference. And this is the modus operandi which Russia used to um, uh, use the sep uh, separatist movement to achieve the national interest. Start from civil unrest. After organize the separatists in armed group, which are able to combat fighting. Next, organize referendum and finally going with annexation. And this is the way how Russia operates. I, I know it's two minutes probably after the time, but I use the free time of my colleagues. I hope you don't mind. That's okay. No, you so, actually so, finished right on time. So I so, didn't give you extra time. Oh, you didn't? Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. He, he, he gave me extra minute. Thank you very much. This is, uh, this is probably, I should thank you during the coffee time. Thank you, and I'm ready for your comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Marjana. That was uh, that was really insightful, and and thank you to all the panelists. These were great presentations, and now we will open it up for questions. Uh, I just want to remind you that we are running a bit late. It's an understatement. We're running a bit late, so I would like you to please keep your questions brief and to the point. Thank you very much, and we'll start. Open up for questions. Yes, please. Thank you. Of course, I cannot react. First of all, I would like to uh, put a couple of questions uh, to the last presentation about, first of all, terminology. Because uh, if I didn't know anything about Ukraine, I would have a clear perception that there is a civic war in Ukraine. What kind of separatist groups you're speaking about? What kind of organized, locally raised separatist groups are you speaking about? Second, why do you speak about east of Ukraine? while the occupation of uh, 
uh, districts happened only uh, under 30 percent of uh, both Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republic, so there was no east of Ukraine and there was no even uh, entire Donbas region. Uh, third question is uh, about using terminology of self-proclaimed republics, uh, about naming the process which had, not, had nothing in common with legal voting, naming it referendum, so this is about that. Um, and uh, what actually makes you state that there was specifically organized local movement when even first leaders of so-called republics were officially Russian citizens brought from Russia. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take a few questions before we, uh, we, we ask the panelists to answer. Yes, please go ahead, over there. Hi, it's Peter, ja is it working? It's Peter yeah. Jackson from the University of Glasgow. It's a friendly question for uh, uh, Charlotte. <laughs> and that is, uh, uh, it, and it's a philosophical question, forgive me, but why do you need to talk about an, kind of an ontological skepticism, a, a position of ontological skepticism, and use the language of entanglement? How does that help your conceptualization of the problem? Because for, for, to my mind, you can still, using the language of social constructivism, you can still get what you need in terms of uh, the fact that the threat is mediated by, by, you know, all the all the, the wider social structures that shape our perception. Why do you need to go the whole hog and say that actually, you know, this thing we're trying to analyze has no independent existence of its own? And that's coming from my own perspective. My, I'm an Aristotelian, so. You know, that's my own ontology. I don't, I don't understand the need to say that this phenomenon of terrorism or, t you know, is actually somehow linked to me or I'm entangled with it. That's my question. Thank you very much. Yes, very clear. Okay, go ahead, please. Laurent. Dr. Laurent. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all panelists for these very interesting presentations. Um, also a question to, uh, to Charlotte with regards to this um, approach where you have these two very different approach to physics which indeed are very complementary to be able to better understand our world. But then I have this question as to the perils of you know, making also the same parallel because the problem is that then we have you know, this traditional approach to physics, which is apparently then for the masses, and then only for the people who go to university, then we discover that this is not the only story. And if we use it, then in the field of critical security studies or critical terrorism studies, we may also have the problem of having, you know, this mass narrative, which is simplistic, mechanistic, and then only the only few of us who have the privilege to be at university um, for teaching or for learning, then have access to a more refined approach to not only physics, but then also um, critical security studies and thus better understanding the various dynamics at play in the rise of radical groups and terrorism. So my problem is, um, don't we have one that sometimes should take over the other in terms of narrative to be able to avoid simplistic explanations as to the rise of terrorism. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll take some questions from this side and then we'll, so two, three more questions and then uh, we will get answers, hopefully. <laughs> three, the last three. Okay, go ahead. One, two, and three. That's it. Uh, I guess this is now working. This is a, a Bulan Taras. Uh, I'm a, a research professor at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute back in New York, but I'm only uh, now at 
Doha as research director, uh, Center uh, for International Policy Research. I have two questions. One question is to Dr. Charlotte. Uh, I see, and I may be wrong, but I see two injustices in your presentation. One injustice is to the uh, various uh, approaches to critical uh, to, uh, critical studies. Uh, we have, we may have, you may agree or not, uh, constructivist security studies and interpretivist security studies. And even one can use the Frankfurt School. Uh, so isn't this just a little bit injustice to put them under one framework and to judge them, this was wrong, this was right, this evolved to this, this evolved to that. That can singularly may work in some cases, some cases and may not it serve better for revisiting critical terrorism studies uh, through the the, the construct and uh, the, uh, the discipline. And the second injustice, you said critical and non-critical approaches like complementary, isn't this a little bit injustice to critical ter ter uh, terrorism studies? Uh, so, uh, and how they are gonna be together, the critical terrorism studies will correct some aspects of it and then they will coexist. Uh, so I had a little bit difficulty to understand this one. Second question, very short to Aaron. Uh, there is also some developments in uh, Africa, uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, Somalia, this new Puntland dispute, this and that. And because of that, Russia is entering to uh, Africa. So what, what is happening in Afghanistan is also pushing some countries out and probably there will be some other countries uh, filling the gap. Do you think this ISIS Horizon, uh, Horizon business or the whatever you call will make a change in the, the regional geopolitics? Thank you. Can we get the one in the back? From here, yes. Hi, hi. Yeah, it's working. Uh, Jeroen Gunning, uh, King's College, uh, Middle East politics. Um, uh, I, I just have a, a sort of couple of thoughts for, for this of the pro and cons of uh, uh, critical theorism studies debate. I will keep it short. Um, but one thing that that I found uh, sort of interesting, thinking on what you were saying now, is that. But when, when I published that first article, A Case for Critical uh, Terrorism Studies, there was a question mark behind it. And the reason was that it wasn't meant to be sort of a bifurcation of the field. It was sort of a, meant to start a debate and make everybody who was studying that phenomenon more self-critical. Um, and of course, then we kind of went into different paths and, and, and all that. But so I think that, that's one thing to, to bear in mind. The other thing, is, uh, there, I think, and this is, uh, Charlotte sort of gave a very good sort of uh, overview of the sort of the, the post-structuralist wing of, of, of critical theorem studies, which I think has done a, an amazing job of thinking through, you know, how language shapes uh, so what, what what happens. Um, but I think what's what's interesting if, if you, uh, I'm I'm not sort of of, of that that that's sort of uh, that, that focus. I, I, I look I am interested in causation and and what happens in terms of terrorism, etc. But I think what for me separates what I'm doing from a lot of other work is, is that. I think once you st start to question the, the label of terrorism, um, and and that counterterrorism is, is is on the right and terrorism on the wrong, so you know those kind of labeling that, that comes with it, mm -hmm. then you you I think you open up um, um, a, a vista of things like you can look at at how groups can become political. You, you can look at that, that kind of social uh, embedding Sorry, and, and all that. So um, anyway, sure. all I'm I'm saying that I think it is. Uh, it is still interesting to think, uh, once you uh, think where you stand in this whole debate politically, that then affects how you, what kind of questions you ask. And so that, I think it's Im important to reflect on that. So, thank, thank you very much. much. Okay, last question. Oh, it would have to be less, like very brief. One second, one second? okay. But uh, one second, now you promise, okay. <laughs> oh. Okay, does, hey, well, I'll, I'll one second. Hanshov. Okay, one second. Khalas, one second, khalas. <laughs> so, so my question is okay. for, to Professor Ramakrishna. Okay. Doesn't, in the, the end of his presentation, he said that we should consider CTS subservient or underneath the MT, M, MTS. Wouldn't that just defeat the purpose? Hello, thank you so much. That's a really short question. Uh, okay. Are you sure? Okay. You ask us. 
Well, thank you. Very quickly, um, well, given that there is um, very uh, little uh, empirical evidence to support sending those suspected of having extremist thought to uh, as mental asylums, what is the legal basis for doing that? Is it the Counterterrorism Act? Thank you very much. So uh, now we will have answers, hopefully, but we will start with Professor Ramakrishna because he's still with us. And uh, yes, and I will ask the panelists to also please keep your answers brief. Uh, request. Okay, please go yep. ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Farah. Thanks very much for that uh, very pertinent question. Uh, um, I mean, I listen, I listen very carefully to uh, what uh, Charlotte was saying, and uh, uh, I, I, the thing which I, I took away from uh, what uh, her comments were, were essentially uh, that ultimately there is a lot of scope for research, uh, you know, complementarity between uh, critical terrorism studies and mainstream or orthodox terrorism studies. Uh, my the only thing I wanted to point out was that uh, at this point, uh, I mean, based on my reading thus far, uh, I'm not very sure to what extent the uh, the distinctive uh, value proposition of the CTS discipline is, which uh, you know, if we want to say that we you know it's a it's an alternative paradigm, then I'm not too sure. But we want to if we want to say, which I think what Charlotte trying, trying to uh, was trying to find out just now. That CTS essentially is uh, a way uh, to which one can uh, which one can balance off some of the uh, uh, elements of uh, mainstream terrorism studies, which may be uh, a bit too uh, you know rough and not respectful enough of human security considerations. But I think that's perfectly fine. So I don't want to say that uh, CTS should be subservient to mainstream terrorism studies. I, I think it should be very much. As I pointed out in my presentation, a very influential and valuable strain uh, within the overall terrorism studies field. So I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was good and brief. Uh, okay, so who wants to go next? Well, what uh, you had a lot of questions. Go ahead. <laughs> so. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to try and group them in in the interests of time. Um, so I'll take all of the ones yeah. on quantum together. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, why use the language of entanglement? Um, and all the other questions about this. Um, it was simply an analogy. Um, it, it was an analogy. Um, it's highly linked okay. to like a lot of social theory at the moment about entanglement and materialism. Um, which obviously wasn't isn't within the CTS canon uh, at the moment, but uh, it, it was simply an analogy to try and sort of draw attention to the fact that you know quite often social constructivism is sort of you know it's put over there as a humanities thing. It's not science, you know. Let's let's let the let's let the posties sit over there and you know they can play over there. Um, so to actually acknowledge that science is not this monolithic thing and has you know, a, a large amount of varieties that, that work completely differently to each other in terms of, of, of how they understand the world, uh, is to open up the production of knowledge and to say, well, look, there's an analogy here um, to something that works quite similarly in terms of the act of measurement constituting what it is being measured. So it, it's simply an analogy. Um, the question on... In Injustices. Um, I can take the second one. Um, isn't it an injustice to critical approaches uh, to say that they can coexist with with mainstream? And how should they coexist? I mean, they just do. I mean, they, <laughs> they, there's no there's no university where one has you know completely replaced the other. They they sit in the same universities. They sit in the world together as forms of knowledge. Um, and they will continue to to both exist. One will not replace the other. So um, I'm not sure I can I can really see it as an injustice that they should sit together because you know different ideas do and and they should. I mean, who wants a monolithic understanding of the world? I mean, that that is antithesis to critical approaches, which are about opening up the production of knowledge. 
Um, what is the legal basis? Okay, let me see if I can. Um, so this is a complicated program. The legal basis for this is, I think, shaky, really shaky. Um, basically, the legal basis for putting people in the hospital who, by the counterterrorism police, simply is this exactly the same as um, if you had a very severe mental illness that meant that you were either going to hurt yourself or hurt someone else, um, UK law would say you can be put in the hospital against your will. And it's exactly the same law, only the processes to get there are very, very different. And they involve collaboration between doctors, counterterrorism police, and in some cases, intelligence agencies. And it's not entirely clear who makes the decision. So the, at the formal legal basis is exactly the same same pieces of legislation. This process has not gone through Parliament, is not legislated for, and yeah, is is very very covert. So, um, to be continued. <laughs> Thank you very much. I guess we can go with the same order of presentation. So Dr. Zellin can go next. <laughs> sure. Yes. Um, I just had one question too, so that makes it easier. Will uh, uh, Islamic State uh, Khorasan Province change the regional geopolitics? Obviously, I can't predict the future, um, but I suspect if ISIS is able to maintain a low boil campaign within Kabul against different, you know, regional governments, facilities or interests, that it could push them to leave the country, which obviously would undermine the legitimacy of the Taliban regime, as well as their ability to try and restart the economy in light of all the sanctions that are already on the government. Um, I'm thinking in particular of China and Turkey, which probably have the most economic interests right now in terms of contracts and potential contracts going out. Um, if there's some larger scale event, uh, like I alluded to at the end, whether it's related to an external operations by ISKP, or possibly even more likely scenario with the TTP, the Turkey Taliban Pakistan with something in Pakistan, is that you might see more meddling by countries that are around it to try and influence what's going on to make sure that their own borders are secure, whether it's the Pakistani government exerting more control on the Afghan Taliban, um, or say Iran, since they obviously have an interest in protecting the Shia population on its border in Herat, because besides Kabul, Herat is the next in line in terms of attacks because ISIS has been focused on um, you know, uh, attacking the Hazara, the ethnic minority that are also Shia um, there since because they view the Taliban as having too good of relations with them, which is against their you know views of what Islam should be. Um, Iran might try and exert more influence sort of on the you know, Western part of Afghanistan um, as well, whether, you know, uh, you know, covertly, or maybe they try and use some of the scenarios that they've played out in, say, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, with, you know, their different militia groups. I, I don't know, though. Um, it's just a potential scenario, obviously a dire one. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's the best I can say right now just because it's, you know, hypothetical. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Zellin. Now, Dr. Marjano, please. Uh... Yes. Well, thank you very much for the question. At first, I would like to uh, mention where this was going on in Ukraine is absolutely horrible things, yes. And we are very much touching all by this, what is ongoing on, and you know, we give, give great support to Ukraine, Ukrainian people who are fighting. And so, according to, to, to this presentation, we are fighting one with each other because everyone started from the opinion from separate movement and local separate. Let me finish. Let me finish. I didn't finish yet. You put the question. Let me finish, please. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, yes, uh, so, so this is my, this is my uh, statement where uh, we greatly supporting Ukrainian people which fighting with Russia forces and we greatly supporting the sovereignty of your state. Regarding your question, 
Well, definitely, uh, I think we're a different way understand the definition of separatist movement. What is separatist? Separatist is, well, the movement which organized groups would like to separate the territory from the country and organize the territory in different way as autonomy territory or even separated new state. And this what's happened actually in Donetsk and Lugansk. We do Excuse me, can you let her finish her answer and then you can discuss this more after? Sorry, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, so basically, we're, of course, we acknowledge what these people who organize the groups are pro-Russian. And they are Ukrainians, yes, but they are pro-Russian. But we're talking about the aim, what they want to do. Main aim of the action is definitely separate the Donetsk and Lugansk from Ukraine. And this happened. This happened. This happened. So this separatist movement mean about separate territory from independent country, which is Ukraine. Yes. So th this is this is my idea and the definition which I use when I was talking about the separatist movement. You mentioned about the East Ukraine, and this is the map. And I think I'm not sure which you folks can see, but Lugansk, Donetsk, Zaporozhye, Kherson, and Crimea. Sounds for me like this is East of Ukraine. And of course, everything start in Lugansk and Donetsk. But we have in mind where all these groups was also used and support Russian forces in ongoing invasion, which start in 2022. And we have in mind where everything start in Crimea. So this when we're talking about east part of Crimea. Where the other thing you mentioned were the groups was organized or was uh, commanded by pro-Russian, well, say soldiers, commanders. For sure, yes, for sure, yes. But they are still pro-Russian groups. Well organized. Hello, I think, okay, I think we're not going to solve this one now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so thank I, you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so I would like everybody to join me in thanking our distinguished panelists for the great presentation and the great discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.